Fall is in the air and it's officially spooky season. To celebrate, I am giving away a $100 Visa gift card. All you gotta do is submit your favorite photo or video of a day at the pumpkin patch, corn maze, your favorite hiking adventure, your favorite fish catch, or anything fall outdoor related and submit it to the Upol app contest. Link below to the Upol app, submit your favorite photo or video, have a chance to win a $100 Visa gift card. Good luck. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Aarons, and today I am joined by Mike Minnick, who is a really, really, really cool story, uh, a master angler in the Virginia program. And I think we're going to be we're going to be entertaining some people today with this one. Mike, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. Oh, glad to be here. So as I pretty much ask every guest I have on the show, what kind of got you into this crazy sport of fishing? Well, I actually had an uncle when I was really young who decided to take me out. He was always wanted to go fishing. His sons really weren't into it, and I was. So we just built this bond between us, and we fished and hunted all the time. So he was really the, the person that got me started in all this craziness. Mm. And, and then from there like we have a big story to tell about how like you got into the master program and this really, really cool goal, these goals that you put, when did like tournament fishing or just really the passion for fishing really start gearing up? Um, that probably started in my late teens. Um, you know, just starting into high school and you started uh, watching all these different shows and so forth that were coming on the BASS was really big at that point. Um, I started fishing bass tournaments, fishing for about three years and you know, as, as luck would have it, I, I was I was good enough to be high in points, but I never won any money. Uh, I think the last year I did it, they paid ten places, and I placed eleven three times. So yeah, it was kind of brutal. Luckily, we had a it was a club team that you get into, and you could work from there to the state tournament and missed a bass, and then you go on from there. Um, I made it to the state tournament twice in three years, and I made it to Mr. Bass twice in three years. And the only reason I didn't make the third year is because they wouldn't let you in it the first year you, you started. They made you wait a year to get into it. Um, but I couldn't make it past either one of those. I think the last year I fished it after day one, I was like a pound and a half off the lead, but I was in 75th place. It was like 300 boats in the tournament at that point. It was a really, really big tournament in bugs. It took three different, uh, went out of three different ramps in order to get all the boats blasted off in time. So that was a really big deal back then. But uh, no. we fished all over the place. Like I said, I, I, I was always close, but I never could get any money. You know, is, for people that don't know, was Mr. Bass associated with FLW, with Bassmaster? Who was it affiliated with? At the time, it was affiliated with Bassmasters. And basically what it was is you, you were in a club. You know, you were in a local club. And the top person in each club would move on to the Mr. Bass. So it was just like the local, your local pro top guy, whatever, would move on to the Mr. Bass and compete in there. Whereas the state tournament was based off of points throughout the year. Hmm. That's really, really cool. Yeah. And I know like even back then, like when the purses and payouts were way better, it was still insanely hard to, to crack it into that, that top or echelon, but it, it gets you addicted. Like again, like tournament fishing, whether it's at a club level or you try to like work your way up the rankings, it really does scratch that competitive itch. And that's interesting that you went from tournament fishing and competing that way to this other interest, which is the master angler program. Like how did that start for you? How did that bug or that fire get lit underneath of you? Um, I think it, it was really two things. One, um, my partner and I, you, it was always a partner you fished with back then. It was a boat owner and a non-boat owner. So the two of us fished together all the time. But we were in a bass tournament on the James River one day. We, we were waiting on a tide to change to get up in this creek. So the final the tide goes up and we get back in the back of this creek or start up in this creek. And all of a sudden my buddy gets a hit and it's a hammer. He's, he's pulling drag. He's going, I'm just standing there waiting with the net. Well, he pulls it up and it's about a 15-pound strike. I mean, you're a bass fisher. And we looked at each other like, hmm, that looks like fun. So we pulled up in this creek and we were basically pitching to these fish, 10-foot of line, just like you would pitch, pitching into a nut bush or whatever and catching these big strikers. 
you know, they were banging up against the bottom, but we were just having a blast. And we were not catching the fish we were there to fish for. They didn't count. We were having a good time. And after that, we, we kind of thought about, you know, we that's really more important to us than this competitive edge of, of fishing for tournaments and so forth, because we were out there just having a blast and really didn't care. That we, and that was actually another one of the tournaments. We came in 11, so we still end up like, doing well, mm. even though we took the time for about an hour to catch this fish. Well, then... Uh, soon after that, I just had this itch. I wanted a muscle, and I wanted him on the fly. So one November, I go out on James River, and I'm in my rubber raft, and I'm, I'm throwing a you know 12 inch fly on a seven weight fly rod. You know, pitching after I had two chases, I had two hits, didn't get a hook in either one of them because I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't set the hook right, and we didn't do it a strip set. So I come home, I go back, I want to do it again, and I come in a stretch, didn't catch any any. Uh, musky i'm like it's got to be a big small mouth there so i switched off everything i put six pound fluorocarbon on i put a little small uh green streamer on there and I'm about the 10th cast of musky hits it. well he jumps twice he jumps on the back side of the boat and i actually had to go move the rod all the way around so I, I caught this big fish that was just a monster in my world you know after catching bass all these time and all of a sudden here's this 40 some inch musky on the fly rod on the six pound line well, right after I did that, the announcement came out that Steve McClandrick had made Master Angler 5. Well, that oh, must be happened to be, at the time, the fish that I needed to make Master Angler 1. I didn't realize at the time. I went and looked and figured out that I had caught five different species. And I made that one. Um, you know, I got that turned in. I realized that, you know, hey, if somebody else can do this, I bet I can do it. So after that, I started just chasing, made my list of all the different fish I needed, I went to the DWR site. I found out when people were catching them, what lakes they were they were finding these fish, what time of year they were pre predominantly finding these big fish, and I just started doing my homework and, and chasing these fish. Um, it actually, from the time I caught the muskie to my twenty fourth fish, was about six and a half years. Wow! And I had narrowed it down to just a couple, well, it was my 23rd fish. I narrowed it down to two. I needed a hybrid striper and a saw guy. Well, the hybrid striper, I had to go all the way to Lake Flanagan. I was on the, almost on the Kentucky border to catch this fish. And like I said, I'd done my research. I knew where to be. It was supposed to be there in June. Um, so I catch this 24th fish, and now it's like, now one left. It's just, I'll, every, I, but as you go along, all these different fish, it's just trying to find that next one. Where is he? Where is it coming from? You know, who's done it before? Um, there's a bunch of information out there. Not, not a lot of people will share that information. I know you, you, you met Will Nash and had him on here a couple of times. He's, he's helped me a bunch because he's all about Max. He can care less about any other fish, except for a striper now. He's kind of getting hooked on strikers a little bit. But anyway, he, if he catches a big freshwater drum somewhere, he'd send me a picture. Hey, I caught this fish on this creek. Well, next day I'm in, in the road going down to this other fish to try to catch this fish. Rarely did I do that, that I actually catch one after he had come in behind him. But um, anyway, there's been a few people along the way that have helped me a lot. But um, but yeah, that itch kind of came from, you know, catching a few, having some some success, and then figuring out that there's somebody else that's actually done it before. So I think I can do it. You, you, you passively mentioned they're like the 24, 25-ish species. Um do you, do you have a sampling or do you know some of them off the top of your head that people aren't aware of? Um, probably the ones that are, that are um, that people don't quite understand or don't know. One is a bow fin. Most people have never even heard of a bow fin. It's a prehistoric fish. Supposedly dates back about a million and a half years. It's one of the few native fish that we have in Virginia. Um, they're primarily found in the swamps, rivers, uh, down in, um, uh, Kind of in the southeastern part of the state, uh, a lot of them in the Nottaway, the Blackwater River, the Chowan. It's not much of the Chowan in Virginia, so you can't can't use that much. But you can use the feeders into it. Um, and then there's some other places you go up towards uh, Maryland, some feeders in there that uh, the people can catch them in. But I primarily been focusing in the uh, down the Blackwater Nottaway area. There's mm -hmm. also the freshwater drum, which I fish it. I love um, the drum. Is an unusual fish. It's an extremely powerful fish. Uh, most of those fish that people catch come from Bugs Island. Uh, Bugs Island's a really good place. Uh, I've actually gotten a lot of information from the uh, DWR biologists down there. They, they usually catch them in gill nets. 
So their, their fishing is a little different than what I can get away with. But uh, go ahead. how do they pull? Like, uh, like I think drum, I'm thinking redfish, the black drum, in the Chesapeake Bay. Like, are, are they pretty decent size, these drum? Do they pull pretty hard? I think the state record is over 20 pounds. Damn, okay. Citation, I think, is six. Um, so it doesn't take a very, a, a monster fish, but it's an extremely powerful fish. If you ever caught a, a drum in a, in a bay or in the ocean, you know how powerful they are. These fish are very similar. I like hmm. all I catch them. Um, there, there's, but there's in very few places. Gaston has them, Bugs has them, and then uh, Dan and Stanton have them as well because they, they they go up into those rivers and spawn from Bugs Island. That's cool. I, like, what are are they kind of like the like a sheep's head, so to speak, where they're they're more crustacean feeders? Do they chase the shad and the blueback in the lake? Uh, not really. Um, primarily, they love uh, crawdads. They'll, they'll eat a shade. Don't, don't get me wrong. They're, they're kind of uh, opportunistic feeders. Uh, but they like to hang around riprap points. Uh, and then, like, Steve McClendick went up the uh, Dan River when they spawned. He called that was his 25th fish, was the uh, freshwater drum. So they, it's different ways to find them. But I typically, mine I caught um, on some riprap in Bugs Island in June. Or mm. honey June. Not, it's been a few years. And it was that's, about eight that's cool. Mm, that's so cool, dude. Like, I mean, again, guys, I, I'm going to just share the screen for anyone that's watching on, on YouTube in this place here. It's basically the, the list of fish that you can get is basically from the DWR website. You got your black bass, your pan fish, striped bass all the way down. Um, it's insane when you, when you look at this, how many different species actually exist in Virginia and in the surrounding area, because honestly, like I, I just have been a bass guy my whole life, generally speaking. And I do want to start opening up more like the panfish thing is kind of interesting because growing up, I thought, oh, it's just sunfish. But then you look at it, it's like, no, it gets separate between the red ear, the red breast, the pumpkin seed, uh, the war mouth. Um, which ones were the hardest like panfish for you to actually hunt down? Well, I'm still chasing them. Oh, there's there's actually 30 different species of fish that are counted in the program. Damn. I've caught 25 of them making master five. Steve McClendon and I are the only two that have ever done that. But Steve has actually reached out to me since the article came out in Virginia Wildlife, and he's at number 28. So he's working towards Master 6. They just created a Master 6 and hasn't been out long, but they did it after they added those other five fish. And I think really what it was, this sauger hasn't been caught, a citation sauger hasn't been caught in like 14 or 15 years. Hmm. Uh, I think the DWR was trying to give more people the opportunity to make it to Master 5, so they added the five other fish. The five other fish that were added were a fall fish, the saw guy, a fall fish, and then they split the crappie into a black and white, and they hmm. split the sunfish. There's now a – I'm sorry, a saw guy was – there's now a bluegill – a red ear, and an other sunfish. So the other would be your pumpkin seed, your war mouth, your green sunfish, those type of fish. I actually caught a really nice war mouth on the black water a few weeks ago that was about an inch short, about four, in, four ounces job making citation. So I'm chasing those last six. Uh, for me, that's a bow fin. Um, it's a other sunfish, a bluegill, a white crappie, and what's my last one? Now think about it for a second. That's terrible. But anyway, I'll, I'll, it'll come to me in a second. Well, I'm assuming then how deceptively hard will be. I'm assuming based on that list, like a bluegill will probably be like, all right, that one I'm going to wait on because that one's probably easy. Or it's could I be mistaken? Fine. Okay. I bet I've caught 10,000 bluegill in my life and I've never caught one over a family. Never. Damn. That is actually a big bluegill. It oh, is. Lord. It's a monster. I went to, uh, I've been working on it this spring. I, I went to Thrasher's Lake in Amherst and I caught 150 on the fly rod one morning. And the biggest one was nine, and, like nine and a half inches long. Huh. And it has to be at least 10. So. And that's some of this program that I think people need to understand. It's not just catching every species. You have to catch a citation or a trophy Thank fish. You. I'm. I'm working with Maryland DWR since I work with them about maybe changing the wording of citation to trophy because I think citation is not as 
captivating to the general populace as catching a, a trophy sized fish. But uh, I digress there. You said, I believe, a level six. And just to reiterate for people at home, so a level six is how many species you need to catch? It's 30 different species of fish and catching what's considered a trophy fish of all 30. That's, that's insane. That is absolutely insane. Yeah. With, with that... Tough enough. Like I said, it took me seven yeah. years to do it. What is the hardest one that you've caught so far? Um... I probably put more hours in for a striper than any other fish. Hmm. Um, but I, I caught three citations this summer. So once I figured it out, I figured it out. But it took a while. Because there's, there's one thing to go out and catch a striper. It's another thing to catch a big one. I actually caught my personal best this summer. It was a little over 41 inches, weighed almost 28 pounds. That's a freshwater striper. I've got a 48 saltwater that I caught in the bay. Uh, but... 20, 28 is about is my biggest. Uh, that's, that's the most hours. The saw guy is just is one of the fish that really amazes me. The DWR even messes with it. Saw guy and walleye both, honestly. It's really to me a 14 day fishery. From hmm. about mid to late February, they they okay. move up to spawn. And steadily enough, they're in the Appomattox River. Uh the saw guy are, and they're also in um the Stanton River, because they stock them in Liesel Lake and in Lake Chesney. But those fish leave the lake. They either go up the lake, go up the river above, or they go through the dam and come out below. And that's what they've done at Chesney. So for the saw guy, I've, I've fished about every third day on the Appomattox River until I caught one that was big enough. The day I caught one, I caught seven. I got seven citations. I did catch the, the five-two citation. Uh, four pounds is, is what's big enough to make trophy status and it was five two uh, the appomattox river and if you guys don't know appomattox river is what feeds into to car or bug island bugs island reservoir actually no. uh, is that stanton does stanton, stanton my apologies does. that chest it comes out of chest and goes in the appomattox and it comes out the appomattox and hits the james river down in Oakland. with that river are you floating it like what is the depth wise are you able to throw your big boat in there how do you logistically no, doing that that Fishery is for, for the saw guy. Uh, it's fish from the bank. I actually took my kayak and caught the fish, but I was by my kayak was basically backed up against the bank because I was fishing. The water was so deep, my anchor would hit the bottom. So I threw the anchor up on this on the shore so I could fish the hole I wanted to fish. Wow. There's a lot of people that go down there to Patton Park. Uh, there's a sandbar down it that they can get on. I see if fish people catch a lot of fish down there. And there's another spot you can get to right below Chesson Dam. Uh, there's a there's a uh, boat ramp there that you can put in. It's it's basically for canoes and kayaks, but you can fish from the shore there. And I've, the fish that I've caught, you can easily catch from the shore. I just have to get a kayak. Mm, that is so crazy. What yeah. is that the biggest adventure? Without giving spots away for all the fish that you caught, what was the most like Jeremy Wade River Monsters kind of like expedition you had to do? Uh, probably going to Flanagan Reservoir in down in Southwest Virginia, down near the Kentucky border, and it it wasn't it, it was more of just the adventure to get there and what we had to do. It was four hours from my house. We took the RV and drug the boat up there, and I both basically almost burned up the brakes going down the hill to the boat ramp. Oh my goodness! Uh, it's it's just in the middle of absolutely nowhere. It's the only place I know in Virginia where they have elk crossing signs on the road. <laughs> <laughs> that's crazy man. but we got there and there's mountain mountain view marina and the people there are just as friendly as they can be they were doing everything they could to help me they hey, hey i heard such and such caught one on this point last night or such and such caught one over there he brought me his rods and said i'm, I'm using these lures and i'm, I'm catching tonight he tried his best oh. but I, I was so used to catching these fish in a different way i was bound to determine i was going to do it the way i knew Mm. So I was actually catching bait and running plate boards just like we did for stripers. And hmm. that's how I caught the fish. He said it was I was the only person he's ever seen catch one during the daylight up there. Really? Yeah. But it was it was uh it was a beast. It was it was over eight pounds. Um, how long did you have to work that area? Does it like a week's trip to, to finally seal the deal? I fished for two and a half days. I saw two fish on sonar that I thought were hybrids and I caught one. <sighs> Dude, 
So yeah. Imagine how many people have fished that lake and not caught a hybrid. Like just for you to be right place, right time. Like that's crazy. It is. But I, I knew to be there in June. The, the fish were coming up on the, the shad that were spawning, uh, coming up on the surface at night. But since I knew they were there, I, I had the idea that, you know, what the center they'd be in. I was just working my baits and trying Because I want a big one. And if you use a big enough bait, you usually don't catch little fish. <laughs> mm, that's true. You avoid the little ones. But if you go and look, if you don't look at the DWR site, doesn't have that many citation hybrids in it. But if you look at the Mountain View Marina website, or their Facebook page, there's quite a few being caught up there. They just don't turn them into the DWR uh, trophy site. How does it work when you you catch the hybrid, you got it. What do you then do when you are basically on the moon, like how far you are away from civilization to get this thing certified when you, when you catch it? Well, there's two different ways that the DWR allows it. You can either do it by length, which you basically take it and lie it on the ruler, because you have to slide his nose up against the stock, and, and the, you can see that where the tail ends on the ruler, and take a picture of it. That's um, all that's required for length. Quite often, though, you'll catch a fish that's fat enough, heavy enough, but not long enough. So then you have to have a certified weight. There's only two ways to do that. One is you take him out, take him somewhere that has a certified scale. Um, you know, sometimes you can get a deli to do it, or. But there's usually a sporting goods place somewhere that has a certified scale. I've caught enough and dealt with it enough. I actually went through the process of buying a scale and had it certified. I had it. I spent the hundred fifty dollars to get a certified stamp on that scale, so I can carry it with me. I like to be able to catch the fish, weigh the fish, take a picture of it sitting on the scale to prove that I caught the fish and the weight of it, and then I can release it. Most of my fish get released. It's a rare occurrence. I keep. These fish are super old, and mm -hmm. fish that's made it that long and, and gotten that big, I really hate to, to take him out. So I, I do everything I can to get him back as quick as possible. You mentioned a couple of times like your fly fishing. Like, did you learn how to fly fish first, and then got into like the bass scene, or did you just develop this this skill or passion for fly fishing later on? Late, fly fishing came later. It's an expensive sport. I mean, my <laughs> seven weight title is five hundred dollars. <sighs> Um, now, granted, you don't have to spend that much money, but if you're going to fish for fly fish in the ocean, you need some good stuff. So I, 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 I salt water fish as well, but um, the fly fishing came later, and I absolutely love it. Um, I got off, off of it quite a bit the last few years as I started chasing these last few fish. Because if, if you want to challenge and make it even harder, try to catch on the fly rod. Oh, but God, I do you have bet. seven species on the fly rod. Now six, six on a fly rod. And I also have six. There's two different levels. There's a master level, which means I've caught. Um, uh oh, master level means I've caught a, five different species of fish. Master one is, and they grow in increments of five. So master one is five fish, master two is 10, three is 15. But if you catch 10 of the same species, like say I catch 10 largemouth bass that are citations, that's considered expert level. Um, I've got expert level in, in six different fish now, and I'm really close on two more. So I'm also working on, since I've got Master 5, I'm, I'm going to see how many I can get expert status in, and I want to see how many I can get on the fly rod. Interestingly enough, I have all three trout, which is what you kind of expect on the fly rod, but my um, I've also got a flathead catfish on the fly rod. That was okay, was that planned? Yeah. I got into these uh, flatheads in open water at Lake Cheston last fall. I actually caught 17 citation flatheads in two months. That's insane. And I was finding a similar live scope, and I dropped baits down on them. And I'm like, if I can do this with that, I get, bet I can get them to, to, to catch one on a fly rod. And sure enough, it was a little over 27 pounds. Um, but I was using a 10 weight. So it really, I it was really too much rod for that fish. But I didn't quite know what to expect. So how did you, did you drop down to them? Like what were you using? Yeah, just, just drop down with the big streamers. All you need. Okay. These, I was, I'd gotten to the point with these flatheads that I would actually skip the fish that I didn't think were big enough to make citation. I got to the level I could say, well, that fish is, I think that fish is 20 pounds. Or I think that fish is 25 pounds. And I just skip the little ones and just go catch the big ones. 
I had 17. I got another That's buddy. Crazy. I think a buddy of mine caught six. It was like 27 or 28 citation flat years we caught in open water in November, December in Lake Chester. Catch them on live. Go. <laughs> I've, yeah, I've never, it's crazy because that you're finding new and different ways to make it more challenging on yourself. But okay, so you said the three trout, the muskie, the flathead. What was what was species number six again? Number six is a redier sunfish. I've oh. caught two in a fly rod that were one pound six ounces. Different fly rod, or are you using the same one just through That's the a, challenge? When I'm fishing for the uh, red ears, I, I use a little four weight. Four weight, okay. Yeah. Seven weights to overkill for that little. Fish, yeah, I was gonna say, like, yeah, that'd be like using a flipping stick on them. Um, yeah. with four weight I, fun on a, on a basically a sunfish, it's over a pound. Are you using the four weight when you're going for brook trout and your and brownies? Or are you going up in size? I use it, yeah. I, I usually take my seven, and that's because when I'm going for those bigger fish, like I, my, my biggest one on the biggest rainbow on the, on the fly rod is eight two, hmm. and I've got two that size. So it's eight two rainbow on a four weight's a little much, and the seven's my only, my next rod. Gotcha. I have a four seven and a ten. So, um, yeah, I was watching on YouTube the guys doing the saltwater stuff with the fly rod, and it's just it looks exhausting with the baits that they were chucking for tuna. I think it was albacore, actually. My apologies, but just to be able to get that thing out there and the size of the rod, it just the shoulder strength you need to do that is just insane. Because for people that don't know, you're not at least from what I was told for those bigger fish, you're not setting it with the rod. You almost have to point the rod and you, you, you set with the line, so to speak, which yep. is, it's completely different if you're not used to it. Yeah. It's a strip set and that's what you have to use for musky. And that's why I missed the first couple that I had strikes on. Um, but the rod doesn't have enough backbone to, to pull it up and set it like you normally would with a bass rod or something. So if you have to, it's a straight line to him and you, you hammer that hook into his jaw and then hang on. <laughs> I bet. I mean, my, my salt water reels have 150 yards of backing on them, to give you an idea. Once you hang on, once you hook one, it runs. I love fishing for them in salt water. I've caught some um, jack crevails, and they're fun to catch. Oh, I bet they scream drag when you, once they're you stick so them. They're so fun. Yeah. What is, um, have you ever tried for like the American Shad or the Shad run that go up on the James yet? No, I've, I've been so focused on these 25 fish, and they're not on the list. Mm -hmm. I really haven't messed with them, but they're, they're, that's another one that would be really fun to catch on the fly, especially like a little full weight. Yeah, that's crazy that they're not on the list because I've heard them like um, basically say it's like little tarpon, especially the, those bigger like hickory shad, which again, like from what I've seen and friends, like they, they do jump pretty good. Yeah, they do. They're, they're fun catch. Just I've, I've avoided anything that wasn't um, in my path for a while. I'm starting to get back. I'm starting to just have fun. So was there any bycatch that wasn't on your on your list that you ended up like um I've heard like the long nose gar or gar that you can catch on flies, things like that. Is there any been any fun bycatches in your quest? Um well long nose the gar is on the list. Oh, it's on the list? Okay. I've caught a few in fly rod. No, nothing big enough. The, the citations I have weren't called in fly rod. But but that one's a lot of fun. Um trying to think. Actually, the, the two largest gar I caught were back to back, about five minutes apart. And I was fishing; hmm. they were over fifteen pounds, and I was fishing for blue cats. They actually sucked up a big little piece of gizzard, gizzard shad while I was fishing for blue cats. So that, that was just a, by chance for the first two. I've actually got four now, but, um, but yeah, that was because you you can catch them on a fly, right? Is yep. that possible? Okay, yeah, I've got a little tarpon fly. It's made out of rabbit fur. And for whatever reason, they love it. And the hook is just the right size. When he clamps across it, the hook wraps the bill. So I don't have to get it down in his mouth. It just just wraps the bill and I can pull him in. It just happens to be the perfect really cool. size. I didn't know that. With um are you gonna be trying to put the the snake with the snakehead bowfin and just because I know that you've caught bowfin, generally speaking, do bowfin and snakehead kind of act the same? They do. I think the uh, snake kid's probably a little more aggressive. I think there's actually more of them. Um, they they populated a lot more so than the bowfin has. To give an idea, and I've been I've chased bowfin on and off for two years, and I haven't caught one. I had one on a few weeks ago that got off, but he wasn't big enough. I've actually I've hooked two bowfin that I know were big enough. I think it was the same fish I hooked twice. 
I hooked him once on bait, and he was trying to pull up into a he, – he made a run and was going into a tree. It was either pull back and keep him out of the tree or something's got to give and something gave broke. And then the next one, I went back two weeks later to a chatterbait in that same tree and hooked this, what I think is the same fish. Um, and I had, hadn't extended the, the net out, so I was trying to hold the fish and extend the net out by myself. And by the time I got all that done and I pulled him up towards the boat and the lower came out and I, I tried to scoop in and get him, but I missed him. And I'll put mm. the same fish. So, uh, trophy size for that is 10 pounds. I'm I'm quite certain this fish was 12 pounds or more. It's a big fish. It has that to be 30 inches really long or 10 pounds. Dude, that is a freaking big one. Yeah, like that, that is such a, it feels like a Southern Virginia fish really get to Dismal Swamp. I mean, Lake, uh, uh, Chickahominy Lake, yep. I've heard, like from a kid fishing high school tournaments, like that has a bunch of them. I don't know if it does still or not, but I don't think it has the numbers it used to, but it's there still. Yeah. In there. You, you'll still see a few call occasionally. I, dude, I, I'm just the pickle, uh, the pickle, huh? The, the pickerel and northern pike thing, like I've heard of places that I've had them stocked, but I haven't thought of a, a fishery in Virginia that was like a premier pike place. I know, for example, like Deep Creek Lake, Maryland's done a great job where that is, you can legitimately probably catch a 50 inch pike eventually there. It, it, was that a harder one if that was one that you're going to go for to find a place that would work for that? Um, the place I went to is Rural Retreat Lake um, in Rural Retreat, Virginia. It's down there with Phil. And a long time ago, DWR stocked them and they stocked um, muskie into that lake. They actually use that lake as a brood stock for muskies. So there's a bunch of muskies in that lake. And it's, it's a small lake. It's probably like 80 acres. But I've had eight chases on a, in a day on the fly rod for muskies. And caught it. Wow. I, mean, I haven't caught any citation muskies yet. That's where I, the northern came from, the pike came from. Um, but I, I've, I caught that fish in April, I believe it was, uh, when it was moving up to go through its spawn ritual. I can't find them. I haven't been able to find one there the rest of the year, but the muskies show up like, I mean, they, they really show up on live scope. So you can set your live scope in perspective view and sit there with a fly rod. And, just, and the thing of it is, you'll, you'll lay the fly out there next to that muskie and it disappears. The muskie does. And you know he's coming. Because now really? he's turned towards you and all of a sudden you start seeing this behind your lure and here he comes. But you just got to keep it moving. If you slow it down, he knows better. He will not touch it. Is it true the the wives' tales that like muskie are like ten times smarter than pike? Yes, pike. If you get the lower Marion Hill, you usually hit it. Hmm. Um, muskie, I put it around them. I had them chase it to the boat. I've had them almost run into the trolling motor and still wouldn't take them over. Um, it is fun when you catch them on the figure eight, though. You run it. You bring your lower in. You start doing the rod and figure eights, and he hits it with about two foot of line out. That's fun. I would really rock. Gosh, I want to do that so bad. Are, are you, when you're going for your pickerel pike muskie, what type of leader are you using for like a fly rod? Or, or, or are you using leader versus like super heavy mono or something? I, it's just mono. I've, like I said, the 40 some inch uh, muskie I called in the fly was on six pound fluorocarbon with a, a fly that had probably a number <laughs> two hook in it. That's crazy, dude. So That's hard to believe. Hook him in the corner of the mouth, you got it. It's just. You can't let him, if he gets it in his mouth, then you're in trouble. Yeah, it, it's interesting when we're talking about all this because I went on a vacation recently to Virginia Beach and I got to catch flounder, go for some redfish, and I really, it really rejuvenated this joy of not just chasing the green ones anymore, that there's so many different fish. And what was interesting when I was, when we were going to catch flounder, I felt like a, like a complete novice again where i'm googling like, well, where do i go to catch a flounder how do i do this and looking at your quest like how do you do investigative work on your end to be like the pickerel how the hell do you even start to figure out where to begin body of water wise you can go have success you talked about we were talking about pike earlier how did you figure out okay this is probably the lake i should spend my time at for my limited time i have available to chase this fish if you go into the dwr website they have a trophy fix fish section and you pull it up and it'll give you a, a listing of everything for the month where every person would be caught every fish for that month. Well, you can sort it by year, by species and by lake. So that's where I started. 
you go look for the year of 2023 and I'm looking for a chain pickerel. And it gives you all the chain pickerel and where, where every one of them was called. And you can say, well, half of them came from this lake. Well, I should probably try that lake. So that's where I started from most of them. Um, I'll use the hybrid as a good example. If you look at hybrid, uh, they're in Lake Anna, they're in Lake Chesden, they're in Clater Lake, hmm. um, and they're in Flanagan. And even though I wasn't really finding that many from Flanagan, I was finding that there was a specific time of the year when they were more focused, when people were catching them more. And and then from from that information, a lot of times I'll pick up the phone and call the biologist. The biologists will tell you all kind of information, what their sampling is, where they're seeing them. They've even given me information from their gill nets. Like when I was chasing a saw guy on Chesson, he's like, we caught 100 saw guy out of the gill nets the other night, they were caught on these three points. So they'll give you that information. The only thing that a biologist can't tell you is how to catch it. Because they use electrofishing and gill nets. They can catch anything. <laughs> it's a lot easier that way. I've, I've actually finagled my way in with Dan Wilson here at the forest office. And he take, I get to go out with him some with electrofishing. And it's just incredible. It really makes you realize how bad of a fisherman you really are. When you go it's, on the uh, lake, yeah. I, he and I went on Lake Burton this year. And Lake Burton is his number one bass lake in the state of Virginia. And it's it's a trophy fishery, and you don't hear anything about it. Most people don't even know it exists. We hit that lake for a few hours, running electric fishing, running with the boat. And I counted up at the end. We had almost, I think it was between 50 and 60 bass over four pounds that were eight different fish that would make cit citation uh, over 20 over 22 inches or six pounds but i actually held a 10 pounder in my hand for the first time in my life i've got a picture of me with a 10 pounder in one hand an eight and a half in the other hand it was through electric fishing i didn't catch them but just to see that fish and handle it and know it's there is pretty impressive and i have been back and fished it i think three times i've caught a couple in the four to five pound range i've never caught anything that big i know he's there though so it gives you that incentive I'm, he's there it's just a matter of figuring him out and figuring out how to catch him I how big is that lake hmm? how big is that lake 80 acres i've always wondered because and i could be wrong and you know comment section you can always let me know when this thing airs is it just strictly the tournament side of things that really beats on a body of water because if it's an 88 acre lake where you know there's never going to be a tournament will that place ever get the abuse as the potomac river or, or bugs island where there's about 38 tournaments how many people really will just go to like just to try to catch a big one you think um that is definitely the place to go it doesn't get the pressure it's electric on electric motor only um the problem with that lake is it is jam-packed with gizzard shag. I mean, it is thick. So bass can eat a gizzard shad anytime he wants. So getting a fish to hit something else or getting him to fish and imitate, catch or bite something that's an imitation shad is tough. Um, you can use gizzard shad for bait, but you have to catch it on a hook and line because it's a mm. DWR lake. You can't use a cast net on a DWR on lake. You can bring it from another lake. You can catch shad somewhere else and take them there to fish. But you can't catch them in a the cast net there. It's, it's it's one of their rules that you can't do. But supposedly you can catch them on hook and line. I'm, I'm, I've got to go try that. Because I think if I'm going to catch a 10-pounder, I think it's going to be on one of those big gizzard shad. I really think that. That's interesting. Like I didn't know you could actually catch a gizzard shad on a hook and line. Um, I've seen it done. I haven't done it myself, but I'm going to try it in that lake specifically. I'm, I'm planning to go back there probably in uh, November, December. Um, and in January was probably a good time as well for, for the big bass. A lot of times in the dead of winter, if you get a nice warm day, sometimes they'll move up towards the surface just to warm those eggs up. And you can catch them on, you can see them on live scope and actually cast to them. And by then the shed slowed down. They're not quite as active, not quite as easy for them to catch. So I'm hoping to use that to my advantage. I want a 10 pounder. I don't have one. I don't have a double digit bass. From the bass perspective, I've asked a bunch of people this question. I think it's a fun exercise. There's no wrong answer here to this, but will there ever be another state record largemouth caught, or is that record set in stone and will never be broken? It'll 
for, I've had the same conversation with a couple of biologists in Virginia. The only way it's going to happen is if they start a new lake. It's a hmm. progression of a lake from the time it's built because of the nutrients in it, the way that the habitat is, the, the way that things um, can survive initially. Because what happens is once a lake gets established and you get the population to a certain level, there's not enough food to support a monster fish. Hmm. So they get stunted. So it, the Bob just tells people all the time, especially if you have a small pond, if you catch in 12 inch bass, you need to start eating bass. They need to come out. They're being, they're stunted because there's not enough food. You've got to start getting them out to get that, to get those bigger fish. Um, it was strange enough on Lake Burton. We caught very few little bass. They were all big. It was the weirdest place I've ever seen. It was incredible scooping those fish out of the water. Um, but so I'm starting to push them. I'm like, start, you don't have to build a new lake, but you can start one over. There's several other states that do it. Texas does it all the time. Arkansas does it all the time. They actually drain a lake down. They'll kill a fish in it or they'll scoop out the ones they want and kill the rest of them. Let it sit for a few weeks. Let it fill back up and restock it. Start it over just like a new lake without having all the expense of having to build one or that, you know, buying the acreage and everything to do that. You can restart one and then it has the same effect. I'm working on them to do that. I'd really like to see them do that on um, Briary. And I know mm -hmm. people that love Briary would shoot me for saying that. But Sandy River's next door. And it's got the same fish. It's got nice big bass. They're easier to get to, in my mind, because you don't have all the trees to deal with. Start Briary over. Briary came close. They shocked up a 14-pounder in that lake soon after it was built. Mm. Um, but but I haven't talked to any biologists that think there is that 17 pound largemouth is out there anywhere to be caught, which is a stare. I've always wondered if it was going to be like a, a trout kind of pond or something like that, that just gets so pumped up with trout, just trying to emulate what happened in California and like how that worked. And I know there's like a thousand other factors that also go into it, but talking about, you know, the fisheries and stuff you really brought something to light because i know some texas fisheries what they'll do they'll lower the water level for a couple of years just so the brush and the trees will start building back up and then they'll flood it to create the habitat and i definitely am a proponent of that for so many fisheries like if they don't want to have grass in a place talk to the homeowners let's lower it about three to four feet for a couple of years and let the brush and stuff really get hold and then reflood it and that'll really i think like kerr reservoir honestly they'll never do this but if they actually lowered it for a couple of years to let the brush and the trees really get in there change that place forever it really would make it a much better fishery well but think about it that's making it easier for the fishermen not necessarily for the fish the fish are still there the fish that move out, you drop, drop the lake, the, fish, the same fish are still there. They're still competing for the same food. But it's that brush and cover that, that people can relate to that are going to fish it when the fish move back up in it, especially during the spawn. And I was going to say, do you think that having that extra brush, would that help the spawning classes and the forage bases? Um, I guess potentially it would help that. But without getting that large population of fish out that's stunning the growth. Uh, yeah, true. You, yeah. You, you've got to get that that piece out of the way in order to build a big fish. Agreed. And, and honestly, I'm hoping that eventually we'll get a couple more reservoirs. I know uh, Fredericksburg area, Virginia, you have Mooney that came into play. You have Hunting Run. They're a little bit younger fisheries because they're, they're, they're two parters. It's fishing, but it's also water for Fredericksburg. And that's perfect size, like a 900 acre, 800 acre lake. It doesn't have to be too big to where people can fish it and enjoy it and it can handle a bunch of anglers. So I don't know. I don't know. I'm, maybe I'm the optimist, but maybe that'll happen too in the future. Yeah, it, I'll never turn down a new lake. I remember no. Ferrari when it first opened. It was just an incredible fishery. The, the three lakes up in Amherst County, Mill Creek, Thrashers and Stonehouse, they were the same way. They were incredible fisheries soon after they opened them. You can still catch fish up there, but it's not like it was, uh, you know, way back. How old is Sandy? Was Sandy and Briary kind of put in it around the same time frame? I think so. Um, I remember when Briary opened, and I think I was in high school when it opened. So it's 40 years old-ish. Mm. So it's, it, bring that up right here. I would really love to see that thing renewed. That would be awesome. 
with all these little like like just places of really 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 cool places are you ever thought of because i also you know i could actually also just share the screen because I'm, I'm looking at this with all this all the different bodies of water these are just lakes guys you can go to the virginia department of wildlife resources you don't have to name them all off because i don't want to be here all night but how many different bodies of water have you actually fished because i feel like that would be a neat little check off thing to do as well oh gosh i hate to imagine i've hit a lot of them you know, chasing these fish and having to go places they stocked them. The saw guys, I'll give you a good example on saw guy. I fished Lake Cheston, Clater Lake, Appomattox River, um, Lake Orange, mm -hmm. Little Creek Reservoir. Seemed like it was one more, but all those to, to try to catch that one fish. I literally fished for 12 months. I caught two fish. One up, they have four pounds is minimum for trophy status. I caught one, it was 3.97. It was a half an ounce off. I was close, but I caught it in Appomattox River. So I had to wait a full year for the spawn to come around to go back and try to try to fish again. That is so cool. I'm going to have to give the Appomattox River just a shot in the future. Go to Whoop. Penn Park about mid February. You'll, you'll have people down there around you. That's just the way it is. But you'll, you'll catch saw guys. You've never caught them. It's a great eating fish. Hmm. It's just a shame that I, I, I personally couldn't catch one in a lake. I caught one in Cheston, and the other one came in Appomattox. And then, I, like I said, I caught like 15 that week on the Appomattox when I finally caught my citation. What is it like? Looking at Chesden, Philpot, Clater, I really feel like those are those like mid tier places where they're big enough that you can fire up the big engine, but they're not, you know, legit. I what well, bass fishermen would call legit sized reservoirs like a Lake Ann or Smith. Like compare and contrast the two, which one did you enjoy fishing more? Was it Chesden or Clater Lake? Mm, Chesden and Clater are two of my favorites. Hmm. And if, uh, which is really surprising, DWR, the well, it's going to come out anyway, but they uh, some of them actually classify clater as the Dead Sea. And for bass fishing and fish clater, you catch you catch little fish. Yeah, the big ones are hard to find in clater. Um, this year, I think I've been there fifteen times, and I've caught thirteen citation fish in those fifteen trips. My family grew up we would vacation. I think it's like three years in a row. We vacationed at Clater Lake and my brother and I would go try to fish the new river because it did. It was, it sucked. You know, we fished high school tournaments there. It, it's a tough place. Do you think it's a genetic thing? It's got good habitat, a little bit of a, a little bit of B like, why does it not pop off? Um, part of it is the clear water, you know, that, that makes things more difficult in itself. You know, you generally have to downsize line, fluorocarbon, that kind of stuff. Most people you see fishing there are using uh, drop shots or, you know, just something small trying to pick up these smaller fish. Um, what I found, though, is my, my last largemouth I caught there was a little over 20 inches long, and it hit a gizzard shad that was seven inches long. Mm. Um, I went past the bridge pylon, and flipped it over to the side of it, and it took off. I knew he was there. I saw him on Lasco, but he, he couldn't resist that shade coming down by him. Um, but what I have found in Clare is that, that it's a great place for channel cats. Uh, there's a lot of channel cats in the 10 to 12 pound range. Uh, I took a couple, a couple of buddies in there and get their citation channel this year. It's got some really nice strikers. It's not a lot of them, but like I said, my 41 incher came from there. I caught a 38 and a half and a 37 this, this summer. Um, I've caught, I think we've caught 15 there in the last three years that were over 20 pounds. Um, it's the only place I know where I can catch, I, I, Smith Mountain Lake is an hour from my house. It's the closest lake I have, and it's got more strikers in it than any other lake in the state of Virginia. But my problem is I, I can't pattern them enough to find them one weekend or one week and go back the next and do it. They move so, so much. They don't do that clutter. I caught the same fish for almost four weeks in the same spot. They hmm. tend to find a place that suits them. The temperature's right. The oxygen level's right. The bait is there, and they hang out. Um, so, and that's what I've done. It's a great place for red ear sunfish. It's got some monsters, red ears, and, and big bluegill in it as well. Hmm. 
Um, but but channel stripers and red ears are top runners for me. Um, and I, my bass have come from actually, I've actually got a 30 inch walleye that I caught from Chesty. I've caught a couple, and they same thing. I caught them on a big old gizzard shad. I was fishing for stripers and caught a walleye. You get a lot of bites on the gizzard shad where it'll be cut in half or have teeth marks on it. You know a walleye hit it. He just didn't get it in far enough to get to the hook. But. It's funny because like Chesden, fishing Chesden when I was younger, it just, it seems fishy. Like Clater Lake, like you said, it's clear. I remember it, it's it's Alabama bass, smallmouth, or a lot of what's brought to scale there. You look at Chesden with, if you go to the upper end, all the cover that's up there, it just feels fishy for some reason. Yeah, the strange part about Chesden is I'm catching most of my fish in open water. Huh. Uh, last August when I was chasing the saw guy, when it, I went in there in August because I was Waiting on the thermocline. I wanted to push the fish up above the thermocline to make it easier to find them. And a few trips there, I caught 20 bass over 20 inches running bait. They were all sitting on top of that thermocline, and I was running my baits through just like I was striper fishing for them and catching largemouth. I wolf fishing for largemouth. I was trying to catch saw guy because I figured they'd be in the same habitat, but I was running over these points, these rocky points and so forth, looking for the saw guy and the bass out there. I never did get one over 22 inches, but I caught 20 bass over 20 inches in August on Chester. And like I've already told you, I caught 17 uh, flathead citations in November, December last year. That's one of my favorite like. places. Now, I don't know. Have you ever dabbled with Leesville? In Leesville is 25 minutes from my house. And I fish it less than any other lake that it really? is. Um, it's, a, it's another lake like Clater. It's tough to fish. For the longest time, it was tough to even put a boat on it because they, they fluctuated a level so much, pumping water back and forth into Smith Mountain Lake. that it eroded the banks really bad. You had trees and stuff floating in it. So it was, it was kind of a tough place to fish from that perspective, too. You had to be on your toes so you wouldn't run over a tree floating down the lake. They've cleaned that up a lot, but it's still a fair amount of that going on because they do protect the water level in Smith Mountain Lake. Um, it's probably got the same population of stripers that, that Clater does as far as big fish. Um, you know, the, the biologist is trying his best to get me to fish that lake and I just haven't done it. Really cool. It's so close to my house. It, it's crazy because I've had a few people on this show and I keep asking about Leesville and it sounds like nobody fishes it. And it's like either really bad or there's a lot of dumb fish in that place. Cause it sounds like. Again, it just does not get the pressure Smith does. Nowhere close to it. But I don't know that many people that really catch a lot of fish there. I know I know a couple of crappie guys that that they go there and do pretty well. It's kind of strange though. They they have certain places that they they know where brush piles and so forth are. And they all seem to be on the same side of the lake, which makes no <laughs> sense. And if you look at the conditions and the time of year they're there, the fish should be on the other side. It's kind of weird, but that's that's their where they're catching fish, that's where they go back. Um, that's interesting. A few other odd ones that you might not think about: a Holiday Lake in Appomattox. It is jam packed with uh, sunfish. It's got yellow perch. It's got a decent bass population, but it's got a lot of chain pickerel. You mentioned pickerel earlier. Uh, the Blackwater River has got a lot of pickerel in it. Nottaway's got a lot of pickerel. Um, Briary's got pickerel in it. Sandy River has pickerel. I actually caught a citation last summer in Sandy River. Yeah, pickerel are just underrated, especially if you just want to go out with your significant other or you got a kid you want to take fishing. Like those things just, they're, they're just easy to, they're consistent. You can really kind of like set your watch to that bite and they're a lot of fun. They are. And they're so aggressive. I mean, they'll come from 10 feet away when that lure comes by and hammer that thing. Yeah. Um, I was, I, I told you I was in Blackwater a few weeks ago. I think I caught 15 while I was fishing. None of them were big. Uh, I was throwing a spinner looking for both in, and they just kept hammering that thing. Apparently, they're supposed to be fun on a fly, too. They'll actually hit a fly pretty good. They are. Anything that looks like a minnow, they'll hammer it. Um, I generally focus on them more in the, in the springtime when the bigger ones move up, but I've caught them in December. I've caught one, I caught one last December on the black water. I just happened to be going down a river and all of a sudden this hump came up under the sonar and I spun around and went back and it was a bunch of logs on the bottom of the river. Hmm. But I ran a bait across the top of it and sure enough, 
change a pick roll comes out and it's a little over 24 inches long. Mm. Um, so you, you can catch them year round. I do not want to rise my boat. <laughs> it stayed with the water all year. And, and I guess because like where you're located in that part of Virginia, it's it's nice because you're so close to fishable water year round, which is really awesome. Um, do you dabble at any of the Carolina lakes at all, just for fun? Um, I go in a little bit. I was on, oh, what was the name of that lake I was on a few weeks ago? My my daughter lives in Cary, so sometimes we'll hook up the boat to the RV and go down there to a lake and spend a weekend with her, and I'll fish a little bit while I'm there. Um. I haven't done a lot uh, fishing. I caught a, you know, I, a lot of times when you got live scope on the front of the boat and you're moving along and you see a fish and it's a big fish, you're like, what is that? So you'll throw something down into it a few times and, and mess with it with a couple of different presentations, lures so you catch it. Sometimes it's a channel catfish, sometimes it's a bass, just depends on um, where you're at. But live scope has changed things a lot for me. I mean, I my, my wife hates it because I'll pull up in a cove and, if I don't see any fish, I just leave. He's like, what do you mean? I said, if, if there's no fish there, I'm truly not going to stay here and try to catch them. You bring up an interesting point as, as a multi-species angler versus a bass guy where you see something on scope, you're like, maybe it's a bass and you throw a jigging minnow or something like that to it because you're bass fishing. But you're a multi-species guy where it's like, I'm, I want to catch anything that swims. Do, do you have like a, a goat? Do you use like a trout magnet as your go-to just to see whatever it is to see if it'll catch? Or do you just use bass gear for it? Um... I don't use a lot of bass gear. I don't fish for bass that often. I'm, I'm kind of an oddball. I've gotten to where I catch these other fish, especially when you can catch a 20 pound striper. I don't mess with mm -hmm. bass. Yeah. But um, a, lo a lot of times though, if I, try, if I I'll use a fluke, fluke is a good a good all around lure to, to try to figure something, especially in open water. Um, the swim jig, um, like a, some kind of swim bait, it's usually a good all around. I was giving that in chest in last fall. I, I was I was looking for these flatheads. All of a sudden, I saw this really white fish image on live scoop. I mean, it was just brighter than anything else. I'm like, what is that? So I grabbed a jerk mate and flipped it over through that and fish head. It was almost a 15 inch crappie, just out there in the middle of the lake, up in. That's I have no idea why it was there, but I, I never would have caught. Never would have even attempted if I hadn't seen it. Uh, so I'm starting to learn. If, if you see a flathead on the on the live scope, you tell me. You can see his fins, you can see his whiskers. It's a flathead. Channel cats, you can tell. Freshwater drum, I can tell. Bass, I can tell. I can't tell you whether it's a large mouth or small mouth, but they have a certain color to them, certain brightness, and their shape held them off. Crappie. Um, the only reason I, the crappie threw me off on this one was I just didn't expect him to be there. Hmm. I didn't expect him to be up in. You know, he was six foot from the surface in December. Like, what's he doing in 30 foot of water? I'm like, what's he doing? You mentioned color. Is it, do you have it set to where like fish are a different color on your scope or just you talking about the brightness of the return? The brightness, the brightness of okay. the return. But on Does a flat it, head, you can see his fins and his, a flat is and blues both. You can see the, the fins, you can tell which kind of yeah. fish it is. Yeah, they're they're massive on the scope. Um, does a drum? What the heck does a drum act like? Is it more like a catfish that you see, or like a bass? He he acts more like a bass, but you huh. can see the profile of the, the head where it turns it slopes down tight. Okay. And he's usually a much taller fish than a bass, um, and of course he's, he's longer than a bass. So they, uh, it's pretty easy to pick them out on my scope. Which well, fish is I rarely see on my scope. Rarely ever see. I guess they're sitting so tight to the bottom, I can't pick them up. I've noticed that up where I'm at, because I fish a lot of river smallmouth, um, and we'll we'll have areas that are you know 15 to 20 feet at the dam where they still in rivers will get so tight on the bottom to rocks. I don't care what scope you have, you just will not see them until you throw on top of them and they pull up off the bottom, which. <laughs> It's fascinating to me that they can still go undetected. But with that said, are there what species have you noticed like just don't care at all about you being there? Is it like a catfish, a drum that just do their thing and not really worry about you? Uh, the, the drum is actually spooky. Really? Yes. Huh. It, you can start moving to him on live scope and he will move off. Hmm. These big stripers that I caught this past summer, I had to fish without live scope. 
I couldn't get close enough to them. They moved off once they sensed that signal in the water. That's crazy. I just, I, I'd fished it enough. I knew the area. I knew where they'd been hanging out. And I just turned everything off. I turned down, down scope off, turned line scope off completely to catch these fish. I had to take the weight off the lines. I had to put them way out behind the boat. They, they, they figured, they figured me out, but I eventually figured them out. I never would have thought Striper would have been the wary one, sort of speak. Uh, That's interesting. They, they didn't want to have anything to do with my boat. They moved off instantly. When you're chasing bluegill, or are you going to go for bluegill? Are you going to try to do it on a place that you can scope them, or are you thinking more of like a pond type of vibe? Um, live scope's not fair for sunfish and crappie. <laughs> it's really not. I mean, especially when they're falling, you can pull up in perspective view and you see all the beds and you see all the fish sitting on the beds. You can actually sell this fish is bigger than that one. Mm-hmm. So then you start targeting specific fish. It's really good in, in pre spawn. When they're starting to move up and you get it in shallows, you can really pick out a larger sunfish versus a smaller one. And I, I like to throw a, um, a drop shot with a like a number eight hook or a number six hook and a worm and to catch you sunfish. It's great taking a kid. Cause, and it's, it's a good way to teach them to use sonar because you're looking at the screen and you're like, all right, the toilet mode is pouring here. This fish is over there, 30 feet. Throw it over there. And they get to do it on their own and catch it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, I really like to fish for them in the springtime. But right now, I'm also I'm, I'm going after the sunfish as well because they'll start to, to feed a lot getting ready for the wintertime. One of my largest red ears on the flower rod came in, I think it was September, October. It was 1-6. And that was on a popping bug. It was a four-way. So they're, they're a little more aggressive in the fall. That sounds like fun. That really does. A topwater bluegill bite would be a blast. Like, And that's another, like, again, one of my bucket list items. I really want to catch a a carp on a fly rod. Um, I have so many friends that were guys in the Shenandoah River when that huge brood X cicada thing happened. And they said, like, if you just had any kind of cicada fly on there and you cast to a 30-pounder, they would just come up and just blow up on the wa- topwater and hit it. I was like, that sounds like so much fun on a fly rod. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've tried. I've chased that uh, cicada bite. I haven't been successful with it. There was some at Clater like two summers ago. Mm-hmm. And I couldn't find anything up near the surface that was working. I've, I've got oh. eight of flies. Um, but I, I have caught them on fly. That little tarpon fly I was telling you about, the rabbit hair, they'll eat that too. And they like cr- hmm. old small crawfish imitation. They like that too. So I've caught them on those. I've caught cr- uh, carp on there. My largest fish freshwater fish on a fly rod. It's a 43 pound grass carp. It was caught in Briary. And I wow. caught it I caught it on that same old fly. Um, I have no idea. I guess they think it's a little minnow or something. I, it's unusual that they would hit that, but they did. It took me a long time to get that fish in. I actually had to, because ca- catch them in Briary in shallow water, he immediately turned to go out to the deep water, which is all where all the trees are. So I had to take the trolling motor and go around him. And scoop mm. back to the shallow water to keep them out of the trees. It took me a long time to get that fish in. I didn't know it at the time. It was the IGFA world record. Um, I saw an article in Florida later where somebody had just caught the new IGA, and mine was an inch longer. I didn't realize it. Dude, oh and my I- God. Like, that's the thing about what you do, and so many people that chase these records, you have to have all this information like Oops. baked into your head of oh this is a record oh this inch is important because you could so easily go out there and then like oh yeah i just had the state record on for a bluegill or the world record for a bluegill but you wouldn't know unless you memorize some of these numbers to have in your head because like bass i think anyone listening to this program right now you know eight ten fifteen sixteen pound bass your brain's like probably should check this it's probably a big deal if i said that for the bluegill for a catfish, for so many species, I bet most people would not have any idea what a state or a world record would be. No, but like for the uh, citations, I have a little cheat sheet in the boat. It's laminated. So I know the length and the weight on every every fish. I, I know it in my head now. But for the longest time, I just carried that with me. So it'd be easy enough to just print you one and laminate and stick it in your boat so you know what the state records are. Or if you can, you're can, you lucky enough to have cell service while you're fishing, you, see, you can look them up real quick. You know, sometimes I'll catch a fish and I want to get pictures and weights and all that stuff. I'll just stick them in a live well while I'm getting everything ready. 
But like I told you, I have certified scales, but it takes me a minute to get them set up. So I just I'll just stick them in a live well for a minute while I'm getting my thing, my stuff together. Hmm. I'm really picky about these fish and not wanting to kill them. Um, my channel catfish that I caught, and I wasn't even thinking about it. it was just my the clock starts ticking in my head when I bring a fish in the boat. I know I've got to mm -hmm. get back in so quick. I got him out. I got him on a scale. I got him on a roller. I got all the stuff and the picture's done, and I put him back before I even took a picture with him with myself. You know, with me. <sighs> but I didn't have that. brutal. I did the same thing on a walleye. Just luckily, 10 minutes later, I caught another citation walleye. So I got the picture on the second one. But like, I, as an example, I had the biologist give me an estimate on the, my biggest smallmouth. And he figured it was somewhere between 14 and 17 years old. Um, and that's, mm. that's an old fish. And I really yeah. hate to, to hurt that thing. Uh, and the sad part about it, if you catch a state record, somebody has to come to you and certify it with their scales and see it. Most of those fish die. In fact, I think all of them do, just because that delay process to get them there. Uh, to get yeah, it, it, it's really you got to do a really good job. I mean, again, you know, Virginia does a great job with what they do. They try hard, but then you kind of look at like Texas and how they like. I, I've heard rumors like they fly helicopters out there when you catch like a fourteen pound bass to <laughs> make sure it's taken care of. But this is where fish care is important, and I think this is something that we can all do better with 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 any species. I, I definitely think. I will give the nod to, to fly trout fishermen and musky anglers. I feel like in general, on average, everyone that's listening, they just have such a reverence for taking care of them where I know there are some bass anglers out there that are a little bit more rough, let's say, with, with their catch. And it's important. Have your ice if it's in the summer. Have oxygen. Um, there, there are new oxygen systems you can get installed in your boat. There's so many things you can do to try to keep your, your catch healthy. Um, yeah, but I don't want to keep you forever tonight, but I really wanted to know, you mentioned the grass carp, how that was a long fight. Do you, anecdotally off the top of your head, do you remember some other like long fights that you had on a rod and reel? Um, the, the one that stands out the most is not a freshwater fish. It's a rock fish that rolled up into the Chesapeake Bay in December and early January. Yeah, you, know, you got a 50 pound rock fish on there. His initial runs about a hundred yards and you're just sitting there holding onto the rod and he's just peeling off drag. And then you just have to fight him working back. It's the weirdest fish on salt water. He just runs straight away from you. And he, he'll be sitting up on the surface, just swimming away. You can see him. You just have to work him back to the boat. Um, I went two trips this year. I only caught six, but the smallest one was 46 pounds. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're a lot of fun. So, But any salt water fish, I think, in general, fights harder than a freshwater fish does. Pretty much, yeah. Um, uh, carp is a great, great fish to catch. Uh, they don't give up very easily. A striper's a fun fish to catch. Um, especially if you can get him in shallow water, like if you catch one of those ones that runs up the Stanton River in, in the springtime, you get one of them in flowing water. He's, he's a, he's a beast to, to keep up with. Um, Carp are underrated in that sense. I mean, that's why Europeans like them so much. They do have that bull, that real, real, real bull run right off the bat when you stick into them. Yeah, my, my biggest carp was caught in Lake Mumaw, and it's it's a great lake for carp. You never think about a mountain lake is clear, but they have mirrors there. That's what this was, was a mirror carp. It's still hmm. considered a common carp, but it weighed about 23 pounds, and I, when I caught it, it went all the way across to the other bank, went down the bank, crossed back over, got around a stump, came up through this way, and I finally got him in the boat. How I got that fish in, I'll never know. Hmm. It took me for a run for a long time. Mike, I, I really appreciate you coming on and just telling us all about this. Um, you know, master angler, been all over the place. You're Jeremy Wade for Virginia. <laughs> Do you have anything that we can promote for you or anyone you want to give a shout out to? Um, as I've mentioned before, Will Nash has helped me a ton to get, get me here. Um, I mentioned my, my uncle earlier. My uncle actually passed away. He was 90 years old, but everybody referred to him as Bunk. Um, he was the one that taken me out when I was a kid to, to, to learn all about this. He, he never was one for big fish. You know, he and I went out one morning on the James river up near big Island. We caught 125 channel catfish one morning. And it was like trout fishing. You could see them in the water in shallow water and just pitch the bait out to them. And as it floated through, they would hammer it. We just, we had a blast. And so I, that's, 
that's really what got me started overall into the, the fishing that I'm doing today. Um, the one other thing, and I did want to mention though, before we got off is, you know, you, you're so used to fishing for bass that you're one species, you know them well, all the baits and different things, you know how to keep up with them throughout the year. But I've actually created a different calendar of where to be at the right time for specific species of fish. Hmm. If I'm going out in January, strangely enough, it's gar, it's largemouth and white perch. Does the white perch start to run up the rivers? You know, February, I mentioned saga and walleye. You also get in your largemouth as they start to move up to, this, to warmer days and, and uh, work on, you know, warming up their eggs. You get into March. For me, it's blue cats and yellow perch. Uh, April, it's bass time. You know, any bass, bass, white bass, um, your, your your northern pike, your crappie, all that that's, gets in. It's, you get around this, this fall time before that kicks in. Major sunfish, by far. They're moving up mm -hmm. on the beds. It's time to catch them. Your chain pickerel's good in May. Your red, um, red, your, your red drum out in the, in the bay. It's perfect time in May. I've caught, I think last Labor Day, I caught three of them, a 42, a 44, and a 48 inch uh, one morning. And if you, you get into June, your sunfish, your drone, your hybrids, July is striped bass for me. That's an odd time for a lot of people. I fish for them throughout the winter. I catch them, but I don't catch the big one. Uh, your carp and your bass in August, get into the thermocline, pushing the fish up, making it a little more easy to get to. September is gar. September is kind of a slow month for me. I don't know why. Uh, but gar always group up in that time. Groups gar grouped up all the time anyway. So they're, they're a little easier to, to find, up to catch. October is blue cats for me. November is flathead cats, hmm. which flatheads roll into December. And then, of course, December gets into your, your rock fish in the bay. So I kind of have this progression throughout the year of where to find these big fish. And I, I it's sad enough, I rarely even look for a smaller fish. If I'm going to catch a fish, I want it to be the biggest thing that I did there. Um, and I've got 28 citations so far this year. I've only put eight in the system because once I get the, the, the 10 for expert, I don't put them in anymore. It doesn't benefit me to get that. So 20 of them were fish that I'd already, I'd already made expert on. And there's a reason why I made it. They're easy to catch. Um, but, uh, Anyway, just if you're doing your homework and you want to take these things, you can kind of put yourself a schedule together. And that's, that's a pretty good way to, to look at it, the time of year to be at certain places. And you just got to figure out where to be. Is there a place people could either purchase or view this this calendar? Uh, I don't have it. Basically, I cr created it from looking at my own catches and looking at oh, cool. off the DWR site. But I, it would take me a few minutes. I could put it together and send it to you. You can put it with this if you want it. Actually, okay, cool. So what we'll do, guys, is I will upload this on the Patreon website uh, when when Mike ever gets it to me, so that way everyone can view it too. Or you can just you know write it down as you listen when this thing debuts, because that that is important to know your seasonal perks um, on when to go fishing. Because I think sometimes we push bass. Not 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 saying like whether we should outlaw it or not. Just like we always try to fish for bass. Sometimes I was like, ah, it's it's not the best time when we could go somewhere else and catch something and be absolutely on fire. Like snakehead, like up where I'm at Northern Virginia, snakehead fishing in August and September is really good because bass fishing is slow. It's hot and it's not as much fun. The other thing I would also add to that schedule too, is your river smallmouth fishing in the winter time too, like that and the musky fishing gets really hot. If you're around the new river, the James, the Rappahan, like name the river that has musky and smallmouth in it. That winter time time is a great time to also hit there as well. Yep. So, but Mike, I mean, you are an absolute legend and I'll definitely have to have you back on when you break your other records. Um, I, you know, I just, other thing, and this is why I, guys, I should get better taking my notes. The fall fish record has fallen twice in two years, basically. Are people targeting them? Or are they by catch for trout? No, they okay. actually target me in a fish. Um, Josh Dolan, uh, he had it for a little while. He, he, Josh told him I know him because he's, he's got 24. He needs one more for Master Five. Oh, that's cool. Uh, but he, he went after that state record specifically. He went up the Cal Pasta River. He got some, got some intel on where to be. And, but he's, it's, his record's already fallen. I think it's, it's pushing four pounds now. It's, it's just crazy. 
I, and I've hooked a couple of those waiting like the Conakajig Creek, um, nothing that size, but at first when you lay into them on that ultralight stuff, you think like, did I just hook a trout? Like the way they run, like they're actually kind of fun on a rod and reel. They are, and they'll jump. It's like a little tarpon. Yeah. He actually looks a little bit like a tiny tarpon. Uh, they're a lot of fun to catch. Um, I caught three one day, three citations in Covington and, huh. uh, in the Jackson River. Uh, that was in December a few years back. Oh, wow. Dang, dude. I can, I can, guys, sorry, sorry for the false start there, but as always, link in the episode description, everything that we talked about. If you'd like to join me on Patreon, like I said, uh, many a times we're starting our 501 C3 casting for conservation in 2025, where we're going to do supplemental stocking where needed, and also really work on fixing up some of these boat ramps. As you can tell from this episode, there is a ton of places to fish and some of the boat ramps, they need some love. They really do. And that's something that I really hope we can do here with casting with conservation. Again, link in the episode description, everything we talked about, and we'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.